So you can see here, we have the six requirements to a contract, four of which relate to whether or not a contract is valid. The remaining two requirements relate to whether a contract is void, voidable, or enforceable. These four elements, which make up the six requirements, we call them elements because they speak to whether or not a contract is valid. And that's what I want to start with first. Let's take a look at agreement. There are two elements to an agreement, offer and acceptance. And within an offer, there are three requirements in order to satisfy a legal offer. So let's cover those first. With an offer, we have intent to be bound. as the first requirement. In addition, we have to talk about whether the terms are reasonable, whether they're reasonably certain. And third, in addition to that, it has to be communicated. And in this case, communicated to the offeree. So let's take a step back. An offeror is the person that makes the offer. The offeree is the person that receives the offer. Well, this is a pretty easy requirement of an offer, that it be communicated to the offeree. Well, let's look at intent to be bound. This is the most important uh, element of an offer. And I'm going to give you an example. When we say intent to be bound, we're talking about an objective intent to be bound. And there's a case from 1918 where a gentleman is asked by a woman named Lucy whether he wants to sell his farm. Let's say his farm is worth $50,000, but he repeatedly tells her, no, I'm not selling my farm. But she gets smart. She takes him out drinking one night and gets him drunk. By the end of the night, he's writing on a napkin, uh, I agreed to sell my farm for $5,000 to Lucy so-and-so. The question there is, do we have a contract? Well, oddly enough, the court said there was an intent to be bound because it looked simply at what was written on the napkin. And when you look at that napkin, not knowing any of the circumstances of him getting drunk and him saying no several times in the past to selling the barn, the napkin is the only evidence they had that showed an objective intent to be bound. And that's the key word, objective. Objective is based on a reasonable person standard. Whether people, let's say the entire class, we took a poll. Whether they thought this person intended to sell his farm. Well, it doesn't matter what a single person in the room thinks. It matters what the majority in the room thinks. And that's how we determine this objective standard. It's a reasonable person standard. Well, in this case, involving Lucy buying the farm, again, the court just looked at the napkin. And the reason is this. Under... contract law. We have a concept called the parole evidence rule, which you read about in chapter 8, and it's also in chapter 12 and 13. So take this book, your textbook, and if I were to stand it on a table like this, the concept of the parole evidence rule is this. Let's imagine this book is a, is a contract, and it has 954 pages. And I know you complain because it's your workout. You have to take it to and from campus every day. So picture it. It's standing on its own. And this is a contract. If I allow any evidence, extrinsic evidence, like their prior conversations or them getting drunk, this contract, i.e. the napkin, doesn't carry any weight. It's meaningless. So courts came up with this rule to say contracts stand on their own. If you allow anything into it, in essence, the contract is worth nothing. So the parole evidence rule protects the sanctity of a contract. As such, you cannot allow in extrinsic 
evidence into that contract because in essence it makes it worthless. However, there are some exceptions. One of those exceptions is to determine if a term is missing okay, or a term is ambiguous in a contract. You can determine what that term was through some extrinsic evidence like prior conversations, emails, negotiations, um, uh, let's say even notes that a person wrote during negotiations. So you would be allowed to figure out what that term is. So keep that in mind. There are exceptions to the parole evidence rule, but it's there to protect the sanctity of contracts. Oh, in this case, again, it seems odd that the court ruled in favor of the woman. And in today's day and age, it would actually not be ruled in that favor. For those taking Business Law 215, that goes back to the concept of stare decisis. Stare decisis says that courts stand on prior cases, that we follow precedent. In this case, the precedent would be that if a person writes a, uh, a contract on a napkin and they were drunk when they wrote it, that that's good law. Well, that makes no sense. So sometimes stare decisis can be overruled if a court did not properly reach a conclusion or if societal changes such as topics related to abortion and we know that's a current debate um, in America if society has changed and the Roe v. Wade case example um, no longer applies when it comes to the way society perceives it so if we have just an outright um, stupid decision or societal changes we can do away with precedent but well, going back to this, for those of you taking Business Law 318, I want you to star these two areas. And for those of you in Business Law 215, 318 is commercial law. And in commercial law, we're going to talk about the Uniform Commercial Code. This is general contract law. And the difference between the two is the following. The Uniform Commercial Code has what's called gap fillers gap fillers and where general contract law does not go far enough the UCC will fill in gap fillers based on the reasonable person standard so I want you to start this write a little note in the margin and say see uniform commercial code day one of lecture notes and I will get back to that shortly Here we have again the three elements of an offer. Acceptance is a little bit easier. 